Again, we thank you for your attendance this evening, and we're going to look at a lesson that's based on 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect through the furnished unto every good work. What we want to do this evening is just break this down a little bit and try to understand, make sure that we uh, have a good understanding of the concept of inspiration. What do we mean when we say that the Bible is inspired and is inspired of God? Well, the first thing that we could do is look at some definitions just from the first part of that passage. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, define the terms as Paul used them, make sure we use them as Paul uses them. You know, words change over the centuries, don't they? Sometimes it doesn't even take centuries. Sometimes it's decades, sometimes it's just a few words. Some words that we use just 20, 30 years ago, we really don't want to use anymore because the connotation of them has changed. And so when we look at the scriptures, we always want to make sure that we go back and look at them the way that they were used at the time they were written, at the time they were given. They are time bound. So it's incumbent upon us as students, as readers of the message, to make sure we understood it as they understood it. Now as we come through history and through time, as men translate the scriptures into different languages and and uh, different subsets of the language, so to speak, you know, uh, the King James Version, what, 1611? Uh, if we took the actual reading and uh, text of that, we would have a difficult time reading it. It's gone through many updates in the translation of it, to bring it into harmony with the words that are being used uh, at, at the particular time the new translation is done. So it, it, it's kind of an editing effect, and a, a lot of it is, and especially when we look at the New King James Version, uh, remove some of the archaic words, words that we don't use anymore, and try to give words that understand what it means in our particular time. But yet, for the meaning. Those scholars who do that, the translators who do that, always have to go back to the originals or should go back in order to be intellectually honest with what they're doing. They're trying to give us an understanding of what the scriptures meant at that time. And, and then we go from there to understanding and putting it in the context of our time. Not going back and trying to put this book in the context of our time, put our time, what we do, in the context of what the Scripture is teaching. So when, when Paul says that the Scriptures are inspired, inspired of God, that means God breathed. God breathed. Now we inspire, we respire. When we quit breathing, we expire. There are a lot of words that talk about this concept of, of, of inspiration. But for the Bible, maybe the best way that we could understand it is, is this God-breathed aspect of it. And think of Adam, when God created Adam, formed man out of the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul, a living being, God breathed in. And that's the kind of concept we need to understand with the scriptures. And we'll deal more with that later. But understand, the scriptures are different. They're, it's just filled. The Bible is filled with just ordinary, everyday words. They're words that we use all the time in, in our everyday life. Well, some of them may not be. That propitiation, that's one that doesn't come up very often. But yet, most of those, they're there. And we use them in various ways. But listen, when they're God-breathed, 
when they are God put together in the sequences that they are put together in, and when they are presented to us, they are the living oracles of God. God's living word that has power, power to change us, power to make us look at the cross and feel guilty and ashamed and compel us to change our lives, to repent, to turn to God, and to commit ourselves to His instructions for living that are so good for us. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Peter says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, that holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They spoke as the, that the Spirit of the Word moved them. Sometimes they didn't even know what they were writing they write it down. God, God says, write this down. And they wouldn't understand it. And the scripture tells us, because it was written for another time. It was written for a time coming. They couldn't understand it, but yet God was giving it to them so that they could give it to us. So it's God-breathed. It's God-inspired. God-spoken, if you want to say and the prophecy there is the foretelling. It doesn't always have to be foretelling. We understand, or we should understand, that when we speak the Word of God, that's taking the place of what many of the prophets did. That they would speak forth the Word of God. And when there's a message that is given, that is based upon the Word of God, that is explaining the Word of God, that is magnifying God through the Word of God, then it has the same power, the power to change people's lives. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 10, how, how can they hear if they don't have a preacher? If no one preaches to them, brothers and sisters, if we're not getting out there with the Word of God, how are we going to change the world for God? Now, we're not going to save everybody. God kind of puts it that way. But we ought to have the attitude that everybody that we meet, everybody that we come in contact with, needs to hear the gospel. And if we will give that to them, then they can make the choice whether they want to be the children of God or not, whether they want to obey God or not. And that's, that's the role that we fill. But the Word of God is the power the strength of that, as Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it's the power of God and His salvation. It's in the preaching and the teaching. It's in the communicating with one another what God says we need to do. Scripture. That which has spoken, which God has spoken, and is revealed to us. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11 calls it the oracles of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and just quote verse after verse after verse after verse. We go to the book of Ezra and we see that Ezra, when, when he was preaching to the children of, uh, of Israel or the Judeans after they come back from captivity, they'd read a portion of the law and then they would make it clear, give the understanding of that so the people could know and understand what the Word of God was saying. But it's the oracles of God, this Word. So it's very important to us. But we've got to be careful. Sometimes people want to go on, beyond the Word of God, rule where God hasn't ruled, uh, uh, bind where God hasn't bound, loose where God hasn't loosed. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to God. But what He's given us, He's given to us for our benefit. So we can know how to be the children of God. Now when we look at the Scriptures, just consider some of the historical evidence that proves this book is something special. Uh, 
Dead Sea Scrolls. There's an exhibit over in Fort Worth that's going on, will be going on, I think, till about the first of the year. It's, it's about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you get to see um, the, some of the material that is there that is of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some of it's never been revealed before. I'm sure it's going to be like pages that are set in plexiglass or some way that it's protected. Uh, but there it is, probably written in the Greek language. Maybe some of it's in Hebrew language. I don't know. But all of that gives evidence about what was going on at that particular time. Or I'm, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there, there are a lot of uh, scrolls that were copies of some of the uh, prophecies of Isaiah. Remember I told you this morning? Those prophecies were past 700 years before Christ. You can take and you can trace those prophecies of Isaiah through different periods of times. Manuscripts have been found down to the Septuagint, which was a couple hundred years before Christ. The Greek translation of that. And you can find it all the way through. And because of that, you can see that the Word of God hadn't changed. In it through all of that period. We have the Old Testament as was given to the Jews. The New Testament. Uh, there's so much evidence for the New Testament. I think there's over 5,000 pieces of evidence of the New Testament text. Scholars tell us there's about 98% uh, uh, accuracy with all of this, and the 2% accuracy are words that, you know, maybe there was a punctuation error here or there, something that the translators didn't get right, but none of them really have anything to do with our salvation. But as we continue to look, we continue to study, we continue to find out what this meaning is, we can have assurance that the Bible, the Word of God, is accurate and contains what we need for salvation contains the instructions there, instructions for righteousness, for correcting ourselves, for going out and doing the activities that God would have his children to do. Uh, again, there, there are things that have been found recently. Uh, you understand that uh, liberal scholars deny that there was ever a kingdom of David. They never had any evidence of it other than the Bible. And just a few short years ago, they found that evidence of the kingdom of David. They could also say that of the Hittites, which preceded that for, you know, like 800 to 1,000 years. Oh, no, there weren't any Hittites. Yes, there were. And the Bible is accurate. The problem we have is that most popular magazine articles, even some of what called the scholarly magazines, uh, uh, Bible, Archaeological Review, and some of those are simply written by liberal scholars for a liberal audience. They don't really believe in, in the inspiration of God. But how many times even they, the things that they find and the things that they come up with are proof that God had his hand in the uh, writing of the scriptures. A lot of people want to retranslate the Bible, and, and they do it today to promote agendas. The feminist Bible might be one of them. You have all kinds of, of, of different groupings. The, the NIV has come up with some, some other things recently. And, and what they do, they try to bring forth an agenda, but any time they do that, they're trying to take a step away from God and God's inspiration put it back totally to this is a work of man. If it's a work of man, man can change it. But it's not a work of man. It's given by inspiration of God. You can look at the scientific evidence that's there. How in the world did they know those things at the time of, uh, of Moses or David that we haven't found out until recently in our human uh, uh, history 
educational process, discoveries made that, that are there through the scriptures. But more importantly is the internal evidence. And one of the great pieces of internal evidence, you know, that's, uh, to base this statement on is what does the Bible say about the Bible? Well, Paul, the Apostle Paul, was writing this particular passage. Well, what was his feeling on the Old Testament? Well, we know when he was Saul of Tarsus what his feeling of, of the Old Testament was. He believed that it was the Word of God. He believed it so highly that he would, was willing to go out and kill Christians to try to destroy the church, which at that particular time, they were beginning to set down as prophets of the New Testament, the apostles of the New Testament, the New Testament scriptures. In Romans alone, for the Old Testament, it has 55 quotations or references to the Old Testament. That's what he felt about the Word of God. The, the, the Old Testament for that time. The word scriptures occurs seven times. It, it is written appears 16 times. In both Romans 4.3 and Galatians 4.30, as the Apostle Paul draws conclusions about arguments that he's making, he asks rhetorically, what do the scriptures say? Just tell me, what, what did the scripture say? And, and for us, that's one of the greatest things that we could ever uh, learn to uh, imitate. What did the scripture say? And then not just say, here's what the scripture says, but go to it, look at it, study it, sometimes look at it again and again. Listen to somebody else read it sometimes. Make sure we have a good understanding of what the Word of God says. Now, what was his feelings concerning the New Testament? We talked a little bit about it before. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18, the Apostle Paul talks about uh, uh, the, the work of spreading the gospel. And he says that uh, we're not to muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. And... He says that a laborer is worthy of his reward. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 4 is the one that talks about muzzling the ox. So he goes back, he uses Old Testament scripture to prove his point. But that other part of the worker is worthy, the laborer is worthy of his reward, that comes from Luke chapter 10 and verse 7. He's quoting Luke. Luke wasn't even an apostle. Luke was the one who walked around and, and traveled with the apostle Paul. And as we're looking at the book of Luke on, in our Bible class on Sunday morning, what does that tell us? It tells us, number one, that the gospel according to Luke was written before A.D. 70. Before the destruction of Jerusalem. And Paul knew it. And had it, it was probably circulated before then. But he's also saying, it's Scripture. It's the Word of God. It's living oracle. When he puts this stamp of approval on it, as an apostle of Jesus Christ. So both Luke, Deuteronomy, Scripture, inspired of God. What was his feelings about his own writings? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 2. Listen to this. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Where, where did these commandments come from? Well, a lot of it, the Holy Spirit inspired them to preach, and the Holy Spirit then inspired them to write things down. It all comes from God. But notice, it's a commandment. What is that? A directive from an authoritative source. The Apostle Paul had authority. Where did he get that authority? He got it from Jesus Christ. Where did Jesus get his authority? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 
from the Godhead. The Holy Spirit's then the one that puts it together, inspires these men to write these scriptures and make sure that they get it the way that God wants it delivered to us. The process of inspiration is discussed in the New Testament. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Well, how were they moved by the Holy Spirit? Well, I imagine there were various ways. Sometimes God appeared to them or an angel appeared to them in a dream. Uh, a message would get out there. Think about Jeremiah. How he talks about it. How the word was like a fire in my bones and I could not contain it. See, he said, I'm not going to speak about God anymore. These people are not listening to me. But the Holy Spirit is stronger. The Spirit within him, the Word within him was stronger. He had to speak it. He had to let it be known. So the way the Holy Spirit uh, worked in the Holy Church, or in the, in the early church, John chapter 14, verse 26, the Holy Spirit brought to the apostles remembrance of the things that Jesus had taught them. They're going to write it down. I imagine three and a half years with Jesus, there have been some things that they had forgotten as human beings. I mean, I forget some of the things that I talked about a week or so ago. You can see how as human beings that would happen. But the Holy Spirit was going to bring that to their remembrance so they could write it down, so they could deliver it to us. The Holy Spirit put words in the mouths of those testifying of Christ. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 19. Don't think about what you're going to say when they deliver you up to the tribunals. It'll be given to you. And it was given to them. And they knew it. They understood it. They were able to preach and teach and give that message as God wanted to do. Because they were under that direct influence of the Holy Spirit. And they were to guide men, the Holy Spirit then would guide men into all truth, John 16, verse 13, but he would do that through the apostles by giving us the completion of the Scriptures, completing the New Testament, which again had to be done before A.D. 7. So they knew it. They understood it. They understood it was the oracles of God. I wonder how they felt as they were writing these things, knowing that they were writing Scripture. Now again, that living or life aspect of this, God breathed into the nostrils of, of Adam, formed Adam out of the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils of breath of life, he became a living being. And the Word of God is the same way, similar to that. It's the message of how men can obtain eternal life. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, just starting with that verse 23, we are born again through the living and abiding Word of God. When we allow that Word of God to come into our lives, into our mind, into our hearts, we dwell on it, we digest it, whether it's milk, or whether it's meat. When we take it in and we digest it, we believe it, and we walk by it, it is living, it is powerful because it's living in us. And when the Word of God is living in us, the outward form of the man is a transformed being, a new being, a new creation that God, who knows His own, is proud to call us His own. We're born again through the living and abiding Word of God. And there, the, the Greek word for word is logos, which is the message from God. And of course, Jesus is quite frequently called the logos, John chapter 1. But you go down to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25, this is the word which was preached to you. But their word isn't logos, it's rhema, which means the spoken word. 
So the Word of God, this Logos, this message from God, when it's the Word of God, when we speak it to one another, we unleash the power of God's Word in our lives. And in the lives of others who will trust it and obey it. Matthew chapter 13, we talked about Luke 8 this morning, but Matthew 13 is the parable of the sower. Once again, the seed is the word of the kingdom. We're sustained by the word of God. Matthew 4.4, 4. man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Spiritual life, eternal life that Jesus gives us, it's based on our feasting on, feeding on the Word of God. Milk and meat. The easy stuff and the hard stuff. We need it both if we are going to grow. 1 Peter chapter 2 and uh, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. But again, meat also. The harder parts we need to get involved with and understand. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16, Paul says that it's the word of life. The word of God is the word of life. This book is the word of life. And again, eternal life. It tells us how to live here, but in living here in that way, we have that promise of eternal life. We will be judged by the word of God. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive of the deeds done in the body, whether they be good or bad, but it's the judgment seat of Christ. And in John chapter 12 and verse 48, Jesus said He will judge us by the words that He's spoken. The words that He's spoken, the words that He gave to the apostles and to the disciples in the first century, uh, the New Testament prophets and teachers, uh, the words that the Holy Spirit then reminded them of, and the words that the Holy Spirit told them to write down for us, for our benefit, for our growth, for our nourishment. The Word of God is given to to feed us, to help us to grow, and to help us to multiply as we go out and teach others the Word of God. When we say the Bible is inspired, we mean that God has communicated to man a message that is complete, inerrant, and beneficial. The Bible is exactly what God would say to us in order that we, may, that we might be like Him that we might have fellowship with Him both now and forever. Thank you for your time. The lesson is yours if you are here tonight. Subject to the invitation, we ask you to come. Take a seat here in the front of the stand and sing the invitation song.